Okay, hi. Uh, hi, and welcome to the session today. Uh, this is FlexPod with Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack Platform 6. Uh, my name is David Kane. I'm a technical marketing engineer for NetApp. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science from North Carolina State University, uh, and I have about 10 years of data center experience. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, my handle is ddavekane. My name is Eric Rayline. I'm also a technical marketing engineer at NetApp, part of the Converged Infrastructure Team, uh, focusing on private and hybrid clouds. Uh, I've been in the industry about 20 years, spent a long time in uh, internal IT in a variety of infrastructure roles, worked uh, for value-added resellers in a pre-sales architect role, as well as a post-sales implementation role, and now here working at NetApp. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well at, at eRayline. Okay, as we heard in the keynote session, uh, you don't need a PhD to run OpenStack. Well, is OpenStack too hard? Uh, we hear frequently heard that it's too complicated, there's too many manual steps, there's too many log files to go through to figure out what's wrong, what's broken, and it's changing too fast to keep up with. So this puts folks in an analysis paralysis mode of not making a decision as to whether or not they want to enable or begin an OpenStack deployment. Um, all of the, the above can lead into more investigation than actual implementation. And uh, customers we see spend more time second guessing a deployment than actually getting production workloads running in OpenStack. We think there's a better way. And that way is FlexPod. So by deploying your OpenStack environment on a tried and true infrastructure so that you don't need to think about the infrastructure, you can just focus on the OpenStack. Um, so for those of you who don't know what FlexPod is, FlexPod is a, a joint collaborative technical engineering effort between NetApp and Cisco. It's basically comprised of NetApp FAS or e, and or E-series storage, as well as Cisco UCS servers and Cisco Nexus switching. So again, these are engineering efforts that have been between the two companies to ensure that we've got the best practices, that we know the uh, right ways to integrate the components together and the best way to deploy them for you. This is all about trying to reduce the risk and lower the total cost of ownership of deploying OpenStack or any uh, internal infrastructure for your environment. It's about increasing the efficiency of your administration, increasing the efficiency of deployment, and especially increasing the speed and ease of deployment. Enable you to roll the FlexPod in or build the FlexPod out very quickly and begin deploying your OpenStack environment. Uh, one of the big things here is that this has been a long, ongoing relationship between the companies. We've got a lot of joint engineering effort uh, over the last uh, seven years, uh, and that has really resulted in about 64 what we call validated designs. So Cisco validated designs, CVDs, or NetApp verified architectures, NVAs. So this has been the these are basically design indoor deployment guides that really are lab tested, vetted out, uh, very prescriptive, giving you explicit guidance on how to deploy a FlexPod or how a valued reseller or distributor might create a FlexPod for you that you can just roll into your data center, plug in, power on, and, and get moving. So talking is good, but doing is better. The proof is in the pod. I know we could stand up here and talk uh, marketing speak to you, but let's, let's get to the meat of it, and let's talk about what we were able to do in the lab. Uh, we took an existing, existing flex pod in our lab in NetApp and RTP North Carolina uh, and rolled it together in a rack. Um, and to take away from this, this is a reasonably specced hardware. It's not a lab queen. Um, these are about one-year-old components there, but, but still a uh, validated flex pod there. And we took and deployed Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack Platform 6 on this hardware, and we took advantage of FlexPod and NetApp integrations and enhancements that we're about to go through in a more of a deeper dive. Uh, we want to take you through some lessons that we learned as we scaled up the number of instances uh, in this resulting OpenStack cloud. And really, uh, to paraphrase it, to ask the question, how far were we able to scale with this? Um, in this diagram right here, illustrate the components of FlexPod. Um, pay attention to the chassis itself. We started with eight nodes to begin with. How far were we able to scale with those eight nodes, with four of them being compute or hypervisor nodes? 1,000? 2,000? 5,000? More? Well, stay tuned and find out. So let's lay a little groundwork first and just kind of talk about uh, how, what we're going to be doing in order to get there, what integrations we're going to be taking advantage of. So NetApp has a long-standing uh, history of con contributions to the open source community and to the OpenStack community. We've been a contributing member of the OpenStack community since about 2011, and we've actually been a sponsor of every summit since 2011. 
Uh, since then, we've actually released a significant amount of code upstream uh, to provide uh, Cinder drivers and other integrations in, uh, as well as constantly increasing new features and new value adds into our contributions. Again, we try to actually develop all of these as upstream contributions. You don't need to go and uh, download uh, most of the code from our site. You can just get it from whoever is providing your OpenStack distribution. Uh, we're going to say Red Hat's a good one, but there are plenty of others that will have our code included in them. Um, and we are really uh, grateful for the fact that uh, because of our contributions to the community, because of our involvement, uh, we've been uh, included in the latest OpenStack survey results as being the number one commercial uh, enterprise class storage system being used in OpenStack environments. Uh, this is not the first year, we're, but what's even better is that we're actually growing. So we've actually increased the, per the percentage of net utilization inside of OpenStack environments uh, from last year to this year. Uh, and we really appreciate that, and, and we think that's just a testament to, to, again, our contributions and really to how well the, the OpenStack uh, technologies and our technologies really work together. Uh, but it's not just about standing here and saying, hey, great, come, come buy our stuff, come use our stuff, we're great, we're cool. Uh, we're also a consumer of OpenStack. We're a customer of OpenStack. We use OpenStack a lot internally for multiple environments, production, test dev, engineering efforts. Uh, so we really are kind of... Uh, using OpenStack or involve OpenStack at every layer, at every possibility. And from this slide, we joined uh, the OpenStack Foundation in 2011, and we've been contributing code since then. Uh, the point to take from this is, uh, even here at the Liberty Summit, we've announced uh, fiber channel protocol support in our Cinder driver. Um, we've been here for a long time, and we'll continue to be there. So I want to talk about just some of the integrations um, that lead into the scale numbers that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, uh, one of those items is, is Glance uh, with cluster data on tap, our FAS, uh, our FAS platform that runs that operating system. Um, two things here. One, copy offload. Um, that's, that's a piece of technology that uh, will eliminate the initial network copy from a Glance image repository to a Cinder uh, repository. So if you use uh, our FAS platform and cluster data on tap, what we can do instead of having that network copy from those two different uh, NFS flex volumes, uh, we can enable a network copy. So instead of copying through the network, we instantiate that first uh, volume or template, as we like to call it, um, through the storage system. So it's very fast, and it avoids that network, that first copy through the network. Uh, the other is space efficiency. Our deduplication technology um, is, uh, it enables uh, common 4K blocks are coalesced into a single block, which enables uh, a lot of space savings on the underlying uh, volume that holds all of your images. Um, from that fact, most of those images that live in that Glance data store, you know, they are either renditions or different variations of operating systems in there, so they can share some of the same blocks. And with deduplication technology turned on, um, we only we uh, use pointers uh, to only store the deltas that have that have been changed between the different uh, in, uh, images that are stored inside of that Glance image store. Um, so it's, it's very space efficient. Um, we've seen with uh, other hypervisor platforms, uh, VMware, Hyper-V, uh, almost 90% deduplication rates. And that's not just internally, that's out in the field. Um, so it's a very space saving measure uh, using Glance with NetApp storage. Cinder, uh, we've contributed a lot of code uh, to, to Cinder over the years. Most of the code and, uh, that we have um, from a Cinder standpoint has been there uh, since the beginning. Um, one thing that you can do that's differentiating with Cinder is create uh, what we call a storage service catalog. Um, so in, in Cinder, when you create Cinder volumes, you now have the ability to specify a volume type. And that volume type can have a name. If you look at the chart here that I have, I have three examples here. One is a transactional database, one is disaster recovery, the other one is test development. Really, you could use any arbitrary name that you choose. You could call them cat, duck, you know, whatever, silver, gold, bronze. It, it's, it's really a, a differentiating feature where we can enable uh, either the tenants or the users that request Cinder volumes be able to take advantage of uh, our, our NetApp technology in the back end when you use it for a Cinder deployment. So we'll, we'll talk about the, the first one there, a transactional database. Um, you may have a customer workload that um, the customer wants that data uh, to be specifically backed by solid state disks or flash disks uh, in the NetApp storage device. So we can go in and through the extra specs library, create these volume types and instantiate or associate those specific uh, extra specs with that volume type so that whenever a customer goes and actually uses uh, Cinder and specifies a volume type, either through the command line or through the Horizon dashboard, 
they can get uh, cinder volumes that are exposed on those back-end NetApp storage systems. So differentiating in the fact that if you have uh, three different flex volumes that have uh, different features associated with them, um, whenever the tenant or the user requests those cinder volumes, those cinder volumes uh, that are created will be backed uh, by those provisions on NetApp storage. Um, so we align those volumes to workloads. Instance caching. Um, this, this is another uh, a very, very good feature that, that uh, we provide through the Cinder driver. Um, really take you through it for a minute. Once the Cinder volume is created from the glance image, um, we cache it in what's known as an NFS image cache. So if I look from the Linux system's perspective, if I do an LS on that directory, after that first uh, image is instantiated, hopefully through the copy offload technology, I can see that there's a cache inside of the, uh, the volume there that's backed by the NetApp storage system. Future volumes that I can, uh, uh, from that uh, image cache, are cloned. So whenever you, the user or the tenant requests more Cinder volumes uh, to be cloned from uh, that image in the uh, image cache, they're not copies through the storage system. They're actually clones. We instantiate through our Cinder driver backend calls to our API that actually clone those instances out. And we found that that's uh, very fast from a dev test perspective in creating rapidly instantiating uh, instances that have persistent volumes attached to them. Um, and it shares the same blocks as the cached image. So again, only the deltas take up uh, new blocks on disk. And uh, it's, it's very efficient. And so pairing, what I said earlier, with Glance and Cinder, with the copy offloading, and with the instance caching and fl our flex clone technology, we can dramatically reduce the creation time of Cinder volumes that are used for persistent images. So we'll talk about Swift as well. So the last two features we've been talking about in terms of the uh, project integration with OpenStack has really been focused on our FAS storage. Uh, we also take advantage of our E-series integration uh, with Swift, which we think is a really good match. So when it comes to object storage, two of the primary concerns really are around resiliency and scalability. You want to make sure that when you're writing your objects, you know you're going to be able to retrieve them later. You're not going to have to worry about losing them. And you know when you start writing your objects, you're going to be writing a lot of objects. You're going to start scaling pretty large. So there's just various concerns you have as you start to try and scale these things up. So in a typical Swift implementation, you've got your Swift nodes, and each Swift node has its own local storage. So as you're scaling up Swift, you're scaling up the compute for the Swift nodes, but also scaling up all that local storage. And all those local storage, of course, are comprised of disks. And as time goes on, disks, of course, are getting bigger and bigger. The rebuild times associated with a failed drive just increase and increase. So you start talking about one terabyte to two terabytes to four terabytes to six terabytes and larger, that rebuild time can become significant. And because of the way that Swift works with replicating those uh, object copies, uh, when you have a disk failure, now you're actually having increased network traffic in order to be able to do that rebuild. So the rebuild is going to take time, and during that time, you're uh, exposed to potential data loss, depending upon what other drive failures might occur in the environment, and you're increasing load on the environment. With using our E-series with dynamic disk pools, you're able to dramatically reduce that rebuild time by a measure of about eightfold, reducing your window of exposure, uh, as well as offloading much of that traffic to the back-end storage system and not going across your front-end network. Uh, as well, when it comes to replication, uh, so Swift stores co multiple copies for data protection across the nodes. By default, it's going to store, store three extra copies. Um, by, using, by doing that, of course, again, it requires a lot of network traffic in order to handle that replication. So it's more load doing that. By offloading things onto our E-series with DDP, you can reduce that data replication from, from three times to about 1.3 times. And the big thing is that you're not going to have to have as much all this local storage attached to each Swift node. So you're going to be able to dramatically reduce the amount of hardware required, the amount of storage space, the amount of uh, rack space, the amount of power, the amount of cooling, just generally giving you a much greater TCO by using E-Series for your Swift environments. Now, lab validation. Now, I mentioned earlier we took uh, a FlexPod and built it in our lab in RTP. Um, I just want to take you through some of the components of that FlexPod and uh, dive into some metrics that we were able to measure from it here in a minute. So uh, from a storage perspective, we had one NetApp E-Series device, which has uh, dual controllers for high availability. We took a NetApp FAS 8040, which has two nodes for HA. And the important point to mention, if you don't uh, remember anything else from this slide right here, is from the NetApp FAS device, we used a quantity of 24 900 gig SAS disks, one shelf. No flash in here. 
From a networking standpoint, we used two Cisco Nexus uh, 9396 switches with 10 gigabit throughput throughout, uh, configured highly available. And from a compute standpoint, in this initial uh, validation, we used eight Cisco UCS blade servers. So that's what we built. Now I just want to take you through uh, what does it mean to instantiate RHEL OSP6 on FlexPod. So just kind of the steps involved here. Number one, configure the physical infrastructure. You know, obviously take all the components, mount them in the rack, uh, cable them up. Um, and from a physical infrastructure standpoint, get onto the Cisco Nexus switches, uh, configure them with a VPC together in a high availability mode, instantiate uh, subnets on there that we'll, we'll consume later um, from the perspective of the RHEL OSP installer, uh, get onto the Cisco UCS uh, fabric interconnects through the Cisco UCS manager application. What we're going to do there is create a service profile template. And for those not familiar with Cisco UCS, it's just a basic abstraction of the compute uh, below that down in the uh, lower corner of the rack right there. Basically, I define variables for my intended deployment, and I can scale out from there. It's very easy to take the compute nodes that are down there and define important metrics from a hardware perspective as to what those entail. So network interfaces, um, what, what its boot order is. In our case, we're going to boot from network um, via Pixie in order to instantiate the RHEL OSP installer. Um, other metrics, like if local disks are used, in our case, no. We're doing stateless booting via iSCSI to the NetApp FAS device, and other assorted associated metrics. So later, we can take that template and clone compute nodes out from that. So if we scale up in the environment from a compute node standpoint, it's just a, bu a couple button clicks. It's very easy. So from the NetApp E-Series standpoint, we need to instantiate uh, through iSCSI IQNs that are going to be mounted for Swift, and then physical data stores, like Eric mentioned, with dynamic disk pool technology. Um, instantiate those ahead of time through the Centricity uh, tool that we have. The NetApp FAS device, similar to the rest of the components, configure it, I'll set it up for high availability. You can use, either use the command line, if you're familiar with that, um, or other orchestration tools. Um, create two different volumes, one for Cinder and one for Glance, um, that will be used later for the installation. And then that's it from a physical standpoint. Next, we're going to deploy the RHEL OSP installer. We're going to take one of our service profiles or compute nodes that we have and pick it for the installer. For all intents and purposes, that's a management node. Um, it, it has a Pixie server, DHCP, DNS. Um, it basically manages the life cycle, and it has a Puppet master server. It really uh, coordinates the relationship and the deployment of RHEL OSP6 on this hardware. So that's the management node. You're going to log into it, and you're going to uh, associate subnets with it. You're going to set up your deployment to match what you physically set up before. This includes, uh, in the installation, an easy button, so you will, to select NetApp as the backend storage system for Cinder. And then for Glance, we use the NFS volume backed by the drive that we created earlier. Once that's done, we're going to drag compute nodes that have been booted up via Pixie and discovered by the RHEL OSP installer and then we're going to drag them into uh, a controller node relationship, which uh, has um, several services that will be instantiated by the installer later through subsequent reboots. We do the same with compute nodes. We Once we're done with that, we hit the launch deployment button. Everything reboots, everything boots to network, and everything talks via Pixie, gets uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 booted down to it. Um, through Puppet, through orchestration, Anaconda, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 will be laid down on all of the compute nodes. Once the deployment is done, everything reboots, Puppet takes over and starts installing OpenStack services on there for you. No manual configuration files. Everything is automated. All those services are instantiated on there. And then whenever the deployment finishes, Cinder will reach out, as configured through the Easy button, to the NetApp FAS device. The Glance uh, NFS volume is instantiated and mounted inside of the construct, uh, construct of the recently built cloud. And then we have it up and running. Um, after it's running, to do Swift, um, unfortunately, that's not orchestrated through the installer. But you can either use Puppet Manifest, or you can install the package yourself or through Ansible, whatever automation piece you choose to do that. And then have that be orchestrated through iSCSI over to the uh, E5524 NetApp E-Series device and then you're off and running. You have a cloud built. Now you can start to create projects, tenants, and spin out instances.
Very simplified process, but very powerful in the fact that the resulting deployment is a truly HA-capable OpenStack distribution. So I want to take you through what we did with that. Once we had all of that stuff up, up to date and built, what were we able to do with it? Um, through this chart right here, um, just base out of the box, I was able to do uh, 200 and 1,000 instances in volumes. And when I say that, 200 and 1,000, I actually create either 200, run through that, we'll run through the first line really fast, 200 instances or 200 volumes, and then I do, do boot commands through some scripts that were written that instantiate the Python Cinder client and the Python Nova client library. So right from the first line right there, we were able to clone 200, instance, or 200 volumes from Cinder in a time period of 73 seconds. Very fast. And then after the volumes are spun up, another script goes through there, and I just say boot. Just boot these instances from those persistent volumes, and that took about four minutes. So if you add up that amount of time right there, uh, that's about five minutes to do 200 instances in volumes. So I did 1,000 next. Um, the 1,000 uh, instance creation right there, the same thing again, instantiate through those scripts, create 1,000 Cinder persistent back volumes on the NetApp NFS. And that took about six minutes. Remember, that's very fast because we're taking advantage of the FlexClone technology that's inherent on the NetApp storage system. The boot command right there, um, to have all those systems booted up and on the network, ready to be accessible, we did it in about 31 minutes. So that's 1,000 uh, available, accessible, Fedora 21 cloud images, available and on the network in about 31 minutes. And again, this is using a very modest storage configuration of all SAS. This is no flash involved whatsoever. No, no hybrid, no all flash, strictly SAS. So not satisfied with that, uh, we looked around in the lab and found some more hardware. Um, we noticed that in the previous two tests, it, we could create cinder volumes uh, at about the exact same rate, no matter how many volumes that we created, about three a second? Yep, about three a second. And so we decided to add more compute to this. Very easy, mount them in the rack, um, have them cabled back to the Cisco Fabric interconnects. They show up in our deployment. We already have our service profile template defined and active right there. It's just a simple matter of cloning that service, those service profiles, which are compute nodes, if you're not familiar with UCS, and bam, we're in the environment. With this time, we have 20 nodes available to us now. So just through the, the scripts and stuff earlier, um, I want, decided, let's scale it out some more. Let's see how more we can get out of this. And, Again, this is instantiating all the pieces of OpenStack uh, or FlexPod uh, NetApp technology that we talked about earlier. From a Cinder and Glance standpoint, it's the coffee offload, the cloning the uh, template using Flex clones, using the NFS instance caching, uh, booting the instance with each new volume that's created there, and then measuring the amount of time that all the instances are up and running, and then some cleanup statistics right there, just terminating the running instances and then deleting all those Cinder volumes. We're able to do 5,000. Um, this is just a picture of the uh, Horizon dashboard right there where we sh I've, we've highlighted the amount of instances, the amount of CPUs going back earlier slide, one CPU, one gig of memory um, uh, per instance there. So as you can see, we've highlighted on the right that box. Um, I know it's kind of hard for me to show 20 nodes of hypervisors in there, but we were able to scale that out to between 260 and uh, 280 instances per compute hypervisor node. So very impressive, and the numbers uh, match there similarly with the volume standpoint, because remember, these are all persistent images. They're not, they're not ephemeral instances. They're backed by persistently stored uh, volumes. So again, 5,000, that's pretty impressive. I mean, it's five times what we were doing before. It's, it's five times what we were planning to do for this infrastructure. Yeah. But I don't know, is that good enough? But wait, there's, there's more. more. We did 10,000. Um, I did this Saturday uh, before flying out here to Vancouver. Um, we did a run where we did 10,000 instances on there. So as you can see in the column on the right, we were in some cases we were able to get over 500 instances um, per compute node on there. Um, and you can see this is an updated picture from the Horizon dashboard. Um, got a clever idea. Well, they're, they're online, they're active, they're available, or at least Horizon says, so what about from a network standpoint? Are these things actually accessible on the network? Can they ping? Do they respond? Well, I did a cute little uh, ping sweep with Nmap and ICMP, and you can see that the tunnel subnet that I used from a VXLAN standpoint was like a slash 18, so it's about a 16,000 address subnet. And I booted, like you said earlier, 10,000 instances on there. Well, 9,600 of them are responding. Now, you know, 10,000 persistent images, instances almost. We almost got to that point. But if you look at the background, at right, the limit summary where it says instances, 9,888 
and then 9,600 actually responded to ICMPs through a ping sweep. That's about a 97% uh, of, of those instances available on the network, so uh, very impressive. Again, one single shelf, 24 gigs of SAS drives is what's backing all of this. Yeah, no flash. Uh, again, this is, this is a quick, uh, quick and dirty test, and we have not completed the rest of our engineering efforts. Uh, you know, we, who knows where these numbers will end up before this project is over with, but uh, pretty damn impressive. So just some of the things that uh, we had to do on, you know, after a resulting RHEL OSP6 deployment on there to kind of get to this level of scale. Um, so the, to be clear, the 200 and 1,000 instances that were done earlier with uh, the four compute nodes, that's available out of the box. But when you start scaling out between 5,000, 10,000, or even greater numbers, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll play around a little bit more with the scale yep. when we get back. But just some of the things uh, that need to be done from uh, a controller uh, node deployment, you got to increase the collection resource returns um, for single responses. So if you're doing a cinder list, a glance list, um, that's instantiating the, the Python uh, libraries there. By default, that only returns 1,000 results. Obviously, we have to scale that a little bit more than there. So uh, bump those uh, variables up in cinder and Nova to 10,000. Um, we had to increase the number of maximum open files. The process may have opened at a time. Uh, we, I increased that to 64,000, kind of an arbitrary value, but just, just to uh, in increase that so that wasn't a bottleneck. Um, from the Galera database, um, I believe the default was 1,024 connections. Um, I just wanted to make sure from a database perspective that we could scale that out. Um, so we increased the value of the maximum number of connections uh, to 10,000 to accommodate that. From Neutron standpoint, we disabled uh, L2 population um, from Neutron ML2. It seemed to be around 5,500, 6,000 instances. Uh, uh, it looked like to me that it was a race condition that was apparent um, whenever some of those notification commands come from L2 population back to Neutron and OVS to prevent um, you know, the whole problem with these overlay networks with uh, the, the unknown broadcast traffic. Whenever I do that ping and whenever it ARPs for all the responses, all the destination max for that, um, I, I had to disable that. I enabled IP set, so whenever you instantiate an instance, um, it's doing uh, IP table security groups in the background. I didn't disable security groups, I just enabled IP sets, which is supposed to enable with faster processing of that. Um, from the 5,000 to 10,000 instances, I had to increase the timeouts on HA proxy. I was seeing that as I got up into the 6,000 instance range, that saw uh, the, the timeouts starting to occur there. I believe that the default is 30 seconds there. Bumped it up to 900, basically said, yeah, wait for this, and it did. Probably the biggest difference was RabbitMQ. Um, I was noticing that's, that um, some of the processes associated with that. Um, once I scaled up to about 5,000 a little bit before that, things were starting to fall off the truck from like a Cinder client uh, and a, or a Nova client type perspective. The log files indicated that there was response times that weren't being met, and so uh, booting was failing, so increase those variables there. And then celiometer, um, we just made sure not to fill up the disk there. Uh, compute nodes, obviously enable debugging, need to know what's going on with Nova as we instantiate this many instances. Um, we tell it also that the virtual interface, which is instantiated through ML2 and the OVS, uh, to not fail booting uh, if he can't instantiate that in time. So I said, you know, if you can't instantiate that, keep trying. Five minutes is fine. It will eventually go on. Just for context, that 10,000 uh, instance run, I think I had maybe 10 instances fail to boot for one reason or another. Disable L2 population. And then, of course, the quotas from a default OpenStack in, uh, installation. You need to increase those because that's, that's just a, a limited quota right there from Nova, Cinder, and Neutron. So that's great. Some of the, uh, you know, some of the uh, lab testing results, you know, but what, what else does Flexbot buy you? Yeah, so we, we just talked about what we saw from a scale perspective and how easy we were able to develop everything and, and, and actually produce the OpenStack and Flexbot. But there's a lot of other things that Flexbot provides to an OpenStack environment, to an infrastructure environment, uh, that we only kind of touched on or didn't touch on at all. So the, the server abstraction with UCS surface profiles, we talked about several times, and I think it's a really good example of how you can have this, the, the underlying infrastructure scale as quickly and as easily as the OpenStack components themselves do. Being able to easily add in, in this case, you know, tripling the amount of compute nodes that we had, or uh, sorry, tripling the number of uh, compute uh, servers in general that we had uh, for the environment very quickly, very easily. Same way we can scale it up or scale it down. 
Um, being able to utilize the, the sand booting technology. So that in conjunction with the service profiles and that service abstraction, you're able to basically take it so that everything is stateless. If you have a server node fail, you can easily just reapply that service profile to a different server in whatever chassis in the environment you care to. And all of that, including the, the boot profile, will map to it and the server will boot automatically. Uh, no additional downtime besides the time it takes you to actually just reassociate that service profile. Great for DR scenarios as well. Um, from a networking perspective, I mean, we're, we're talking about you know, industry standard, you know, kind of the de facto industry standard of Cisco networking, uh, Nexus switching, the, the command line interface, the feature sets that everyone is used to, a uh, very large amount of familiarity, and usually cutting, en cutting edge features. Um, we're also talking about from an OpenStack perspective with networking, you know, taking advantage of the ML2 VXLAN or the ML2 Nexus modular drivers inside of uh, the Rel OSP installer. From a storage perspective, we, we've talked a lot about uh, the Cinder integration especially, but also the Swift and, and, and uh, Glance uh, configuration, most of which is being done automatically for you inside the, OS, the Rel OSP installer. So not a lot of manual configuration being done uh, after the fact that you need to worry about. But we didn't really talk too much about the underlying storage itself. If anything, we've probably talked more about the compute side of things. But the storage makes, you know, uh, takes a lot of notable uh, point of fact as well. When you start talking about, when you're talking about NetApp FAS, you're talking about clustered data on tap, we're talking about the only unified scale-out storage system supporting block, supporting NAS, supporting block and NAS at the same time, uh, as well as being able to support just spinning media, hybrid with spinning media and flash, or all flash. All of them with inside the same scale out cluster if you want to. The same pane of glass, the same single management interface. No one else can touch that today. No one else is able to do that. And it makes it very, very easy for you to implement whatever kind of storage services that you need for your environment. And to be able to share the same management plane, the same storage services with your OpenStack environment as your existing environment. Uh, whether that existing environment is a, a VMware environment, a Hyper-V environment, bare metal servers, whatever it is. Um, we're going to be able to support any, any of the services that you require. And part of the how that, uh, those storage services are actually being presented is, is being done through what we call storage virtual machines, which is a way of taking your uh, physical array and virtualizing it. So whether it's a single HA pair or whether it's 12 HA pairs, taking to these 12 disparate arrays and being able to present them up to your host either as a single entity or as multiple entities. So the concept behind a storage virtual machine is that to the host, it's connecting to a different physical box, regardless of whether it's uh, uh, being done on one node or 12 nodes or 24 nodes. And this includes all the MAC addresses, IP addresses, uh, WWPNs, any of those things. It, this works really well from a tenancy perspective, where you can map a, an SVM to a particular tenant, to the admin tenant, to an individual tenant. And between e SVMs, the storage cannot be modified, cannot be touched. So if you've got tenant A storage on its own SVM, nothing that happens with that SVM from any management interface is going to impact the uh, storage that's being presented from tenant B or tenant C all the way down. So the other thing we do is a lot of high availability out of the box. So you know, a cloud platform is fantastic, but you need to make sure the infrastructure is going to be there underneath it to, su to uh, support it. So we make sure that all of the kind of basic stuff is there. So redundancy everywhere, multipath everywhere. So any single failure isn't going to take anything down. In fact, you can withstand multiple failures without having any degradation to the environment. And being able to withstand failures is great, but it's kind of old hat. We're expecting that you're going to be able to withstand failures. But you also have to be able to do things like online upgrades whether that's upgrades of your UCS uh, firmware, upgrades of the Nexus firmware, upgrades of data on tap from an OS perspective, or from any of the subcomponent firmware, disk firmware, shellware, et cetera. Be able to do all of those things online without impacting services while everything remains running. And then extending that to any other maintenance operation. So again, this is a scale out cluster. So we can move as we need to, whether it's from a load balancing perspective, whether it's from a uh, hardware refresh perspective, uh, however we want to, we can move around the logical interfaces that the tenants or the hosts are actually accessing the storage with between physical nodes wherever we want. We can move the volumes, those cinder volumes uh, or the glance images are all living on to any node in the cluster. We can do this again for rebalancing to give it more performance. Perhaps that cinder volume before was fine on SATA, but now it's going to need to be on SSD. That can all be moved in the background live uh, to, the, to give the required capabilities that's needed for the application without ever impacting the, the, the tenant, without ever impacting the actual workload itself other than it's suddenly getting better performance. 
And again, because we're able to do all this uh, abstraction at both the compute and the storage level, we can do online expansion or online contraction as you need to. So whether you're growing your private cloud or maybe shrinking your private cloud as you're turning into a hybrid cloud and starting to burst into hyperscalers, either way, you're able to do that up or down seamlessly online, uh, again, without having any impact. And then talking about scaling up and scaling down, the infrastructure ultimately needs to be able to scale with, with OpenStack. We've already shown you that we could do almost 10,000 on a pretty small configuration. We're talking about 40 uh, CPUs for the compute hypervisors. Uh, in a single UCS domain, we can actually scale up to 160 half-width servers, which equates to 320 CPUs, uh, you know, with over a dozen cores per CPU. So you can scale up a tremendous amount just from the compute perspective, uh, from the CPUs, from core count, from memory. And if you need to scale beyond uh, 160, you can go beyond that as well and still maintain a relatively single pane of glass kind of management by using things like UCS Director and UCS Central. From a storage perspective, again, NetFast scales up and out. So we can scale up to as much as over 8 petabytes in a single HA pair uh, with our largest 8080 EX system, um, or out to as much as 100 petabytes in the fully scaled out NAS cluster. So whatever kind of scale you need, whatever services that you need, we can support that with NetFast. Um, and just touching again on the uh, storage virtual machines and the way that we're able to carve up the presentation of the storage arrays, we can actually scale up to 250 SVMs in a SAN cluster or 1,000 SVMs in a NAS cluster. And that really is more a, a feature of a practical nature of how many um, fiber channel interfaces and things like that you're actually going to have out there to be able to do to connect to the end host. Um, and, if, and a factor of how many uh, storage controllers we're actually supporting inside of each of those uh, nodes, where a SAN cluster can scale up to eight nodes, and a NAS cluster scales up to 24. So quite a bit of uh, capacity, quite a bit of performance to be able to support from both the compute and the storage side. And a cluster, that's a single point of management. It's a single point of management. If you choose to, you can actually delegate management at the SVM level, but otherwise, as the administrator, as the operator, you can do everything from the same pane of glass, the same GUI, the same CLI, everything's consistent from the small system to the largest. So we'll wrap up. We really appreciate you guys uh, listening to us. And, and uh, if there's anything we want you to take away, it's really that FlexPod is really the proven infrastructure that you can use to then use that to stand up your OpenStack on top of it. Take advantage of all the joint engineering efforts, all of the uh, decades of experience that we have with storage, that Cisco has from the networking and the compute side, uh, to be able to maintain a, a very consistent uh, environment, a very resilient environment. Um, both FAS and E-Series are actually rated for over five nines of uptime. And the fact that we've pr provided a lot of integration between the companies and between the communities uh, that we take advantage of and then we basically turn that around into validated designs and documentation for you to be able to use to build out your infrastructure or that someone else will use to build out your infrastructure for you. Uh, but either way, be able to build off of the knowledge of others and build off of the sweat, tears, and late nights other people have spent. Um, and speaking of all that uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tears and the ongoing collateral, so. Uh, what we've been talking about today, this architecture and this testing, there is going to be some uh, documentation coming out in the very near future that you'll be seeing. Uh, that This is on all the result of this joint engineering effort between NetApp, between Cisco and Red Hat uh, in providing this, um, this, uh, this implementation. Uh, already today, we actually have the installer video available showing you how we actually went through and did an installation in this environment. You can come check it out at our booth. It's about a seven minute long video. Or you can just go online and check it out yourself. Um, very, very simple and easy, just showing you how easy it is. Despite all the disparate parts, all the moving pieces, it's very simple, quick, and easy to get uh, uh, Rel OSP up and running on a FlexPod. Right, and scalability is not on here, but for those that say that OpenStack does not scale, well, it does on FlexPod. So we've got a lot of sessions here at OpenStack. Um, we actually have 17 sessions, uh, 15 of them we haven't actually uh, had yet. Uh, we could put all 15 sessions on here, but you wouldn't be able to read it, and I wouldn't have time to tell you about them. Uh, but there's two here to point out specifically. They're both focused on FlexPod and uh, OpenStack. We've got actually two different customers who are going to be speaking about their experiences. We've got Telus, who are going to be speaking tomorrow, as well as Verd Data, who will be speaking on Thursday. Um, so feel free to check those out. Uh, check out any of the other sessions that we have. Uh, whether the recordings are online while you're here. Uh, speaking of online, we've always got our uh, OpenStack Deployment Operations Guide available. This is continuously updated out there on netapp.github.io, uh, which is also where all of our code is actually housed as well. So you see all of that upstream code uh, living up there. Uh, and you can also follow us at OpenStack, uh, at OpenStack uh, NetApp uh, on Twitter. 
Uh, and certainly come see us, obviously, here in the ballroom, uh, right down there in uh, S13, just down here on the right. Uh, come down, stop in, take a look at the demos, uh, ask any questions. Uh, you know, just uh, come on down and talk to us. Yeah, and if you have any questions, we'll be down here uh, below the stage. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much.